Hi, I'm Ray Locker, the editorial consultant for the Heart Mountain Wyoming Foundation. And I'm proud, proud to co-host this Authors of Incarceration panel with Aaron Oyama, a PhD candidate at Brown University, a member of our National Endowment shop faculty that we had this week. We've got a great uh, panel in store for you right now. We have four authors of books that have come out in the last year about the Japanese American incarceration. Shirley Ann Higuchi, chair of the Heart Mountain Wyoming Foundation, whose book Sets a Ghost Secret came out last fall. Frank Abe, longtime writer and stu student of the Heart Mountain and other draft resistors, author of the graphic novel We Hereby Refuse. Bradford Pearson, author of the tremendous sports book and history of the incarceration, The Eagles of Heart Mountain. And Daniel James Brown, whose new book, Facing the Mountain, looks at the 442nd Regimental Combat Team that fought so valiantly in Italy and France during the war. So we're going to, each author will talk for about three to five minutes about their book in order of Shirley, Frank, Brad, and Dan. So take it away, Shirley. Thank you very much, and thank you for having me here today uh, on this distinguished panel. Um, this history of my book really uh, began, you know, there's like an echo, and um, is it just me? I'm, I'm experiencing an echo here. Okay. Uh, I don't know if Frank's on mute. Okay. Uh, well, the history is is that um, when my mother passed away in 2005 of pancreatic cancer, we didn't realize that she was secretly sending money to Heart Mountain, dreaming of something being built there. And uh, I really can't explain that uh, the experience of growing up as a Japanese American in Ann Arbor, Michigan, when I had no other friends that were Japanese American, being isolated and not understanding the story nor the behavior of my own family members around that secret. Uh, but on her deathbed, she wanted her memorial money to go to the Heart Mountain Wyoming Foundation. And after becoming chair uh, of the foundation and meeting um, uh, characters in my book, like Takashi Hoshizaki, who I know uh, many of you know as a resistor and a current board member, you know, learning about the bravery of the uh, 442 and other military service, and then um, relating to Brad's book about the activities that happened, you know, Heart Mountain really is a deep, rich story. And um, beginning to be able to meet the characters in the book, you know, working with the characters in the book and evolving with them, I felt it was important to document the story, tell the story to the world. And I think what uh, makes my book a little bit different than everyone else's is that mine is a memoir. I talk about my own personal journey experiences and the evolution of my own experience, but I also started with my characters when their grandparents and their family members first arrived at the United States in the early 1900s till today. And I think Ray and Aaron don't appear to be on the well, screen. Surely I'll, I'll pick it up then. Uh, okay. Five, Take the wheel. Five, five minutes. Uh, so, so we hereby refuse. We modestly call this the story of camp as, you, as you've never seen it before. And there's a couple reasons for that. Uh, just the idea that there was resistance in the camps, to the camps, was something that has only been talked about in the Japanese American community for, in the last 20 years. Uh, before that, it was accepted that, that our response to this massive uh, violation of constitutional rights uh, could be summed up in two Japanese phrases, shikata kanai, Japanese for can't be helped, passive resignation in the face of injustice, or go for broke, patriotic self-sacrifice and the spilling of one's, of one's blood to prove one's loyalty to America. Those two opposites never rang true for me, so I've been glad to help develop and deliver the story of a third thing, and that was camp resistance. So we wove these, uh, we have three characters, three main characters, we wove, wove them in a single timeline to create <clears throat> kind of an epic narrative of camp resistance. Here's Jim Akutsu, refuses to be drafted from the camp at Minidoka. He tried to enlist before and after Pearl Harbor, but rejected for flat feet. His father was separated from their family by the FBI and sent to a Justice Department inter internment camp for aliens in Montana. His family loses the home they own and the shoe repair business in Seattle. Uh, then, after two years of this, he's given a draft notice. And he says, no. Uh, I didn't get due process and a fair hearing before I was sent to this concentration camp. I want my day in court. 
Second character, Hiroshi Kashiwagi and his family are removed from their farm outside Sacramento, sent to Tule Lake when it was just another relocation camp. Once there, he refuses to the government's pressure to sign a loyalty oath, and he's threatened with prison time and hefty fines. But still, under duress, he, si he says, no, I'm not going to sign it. They remain at Tule Lake when it's fortified as the WRA's segregation camp for those who refuse to answer the questionnaire. And there he caves to family pressure to renounce his U.S. citizenship, and he avoids being deported only by enlisting the aid of attorney Wayne Collins. By contrast, our third character, Mitsuya Ando's story is fairly straightforward. She's a reluctant recruit to a lawsuit contesting her imprisonment. Uh, WRA offers her a chance to leave camp alone if she drops her case, but instead of choosing her own freedom, as you can see here in this meeting with Philip Glick, the WRA solicitor, she decides to stay in camp for two more years in order to, for her case to reach the U.S. Supreme Court, where her victory forces the government to shut down the camps. Educators have said that they really appreciate having a story of a woman, a strong woman, to teach. Uh, so here we've introduced a new story they can teach of a woman with agency in the incarceration story. And then going back to the Jim Okutsu story, another example of women with agency is the Mother Society of Minidoka. And we devote three pages to these immigrant mothers in camp who organize a letter writing campaign to demand restoration of full citizenship rights to their precious sons before they're sent to the front uh, to fight and possibly die. So our book is a collaboration uh, with Tomiko Nimura and two artists. Uh, Ross Ishikawa does the color drawings and Matsusaki does the black and white drawings. Once we had these characters in place, I realized you can't talk about resistance without seeing what they're resisting against. So we show the antagonists who drive the actions that divide the people in camp. There's a fourth character, the, the U.S. government and our own Japanese American leaders who were embraced by the government as their liaison to the community. So here's Colonel Carl Bendetson uh, at the, behind the desk, uh, bringing in wartime JSCL leaders Mike Masaoka and Saab Kido to a meeting at the Presidio in San Francisco, where he says, look, this is going to happen. This mass removal is going to happen, and we'd like you to, to get your people to cooperate. Uh, we can do this the easy way or the army way. And whether it was a bluff or not, it worked on Masaoka. This drawing shows what he actually talked about, uh, about his fears, well into the 1980s. I, I can still hear his voice saying, do you want people murdered on the streets? Do you want tanks to come in and destroy the little ghettos that we have enjoyed? I think we had no alternative. So um, here we show a, a private conversation at the Presidio. And while we can't know exactly what was said in scenes like these, uh, our book makes every effort to draw the words from the historical record so that every line on every page is true to character. That, in brief, is the story of We Hereby Refuse. Uh, thanks a lot. Back to you, Ray and Aaron. All right, I'll take it over. Um, my book is The Eagles of Heart Mountain, and it is the story of the greatest high school football team in the history of the state of Wyoming, the Heart Mountain Eagles. Um, what appealed to me about this story was that um, sort of the universality of the fact that we've all been teenagers. So I wanted to tell the story of Japanese American incarceration through the eyes of teenagers. And um, these young men were faced with you know, the grave injustice of incarceration to begin with. But then um, as Frank's book and all of our books get into, um, you know, th then they also have to face down the prospect of getting drafted into the military. And I thought that as someone who has previously been a 17, 18, 19 year old teenage boy, I thought that that was sort of a universal way of looking at incarceration and looking at the wrongs of, of that time to sort of put the reader in the shoes of what, what it was like to be a teenager and to have to make those sort of major decisions, um, not only on um, for yourself, but have to make them for your family and for your community. And um, I thought that there was a, a certain, uh, quote, American way uh, to look at that story through the lens of, of sports and football. And I think that um, for me at least, um, I viewed my book as sort of a bit of a Trojan horse, where if I could convince people to pick up a book about football and World War II, I could actually make it a book about something much more and much different. 
Um, and I've gotten kind of dinged by a lot of people and reviews because of that. Um, so, uh, but I wouldn't change one thing. I I'm glad that I framed the book the way I did and included so much history as opposed to just um, writing about the football exploits. So that's sort of a, a quick version of what the Eagles of Heart Mountain is all about. Unmuted. There we go. Um, so uh, first of all, thanks everybody for having me uh, here today. My book, uh, Facing the Mountain, grew out of conversations I had with uh, Tom McKeda at uh, the Den Show Project beginning in 2015. Uh, we were actually on an award stage together and Tom was explaining what he's been doing for the last 25 years, collecting oral histories of Japanese Americans. And I was just, you know, really interested in what he was doing. So I went home and I, um, I, started, I sat down and I started watching some of these interviews that Tom's done over the decades. And I was just mesmerized by a lot of the stories. I'm a person that's all about story. I'm, I'm drawn to story. And these were the kinds of stories um, I, I like anyway. They were about young Americans dealing with really challenging circumstances, all, of course, in the context of the Japanese um, American experience. And this was also, when I was doing this, was right about the time that the Trump administration was coming uh, into power. and. Um, so, you know, I was reading about uh, uh, these folks' immigrant experience and then coming home and hearing all this rhetoric, anti-immigrant rhetoric. And I was reading about tam families um, torn apart by the incarcerations. And I was coming home and um, hearing all this rhetoric uh, uh, or actually seeing what was happening on our southern border. And so the whole time that I was researching the book before I actually started to write it, uh, there were all these echoes between the past and what was actually happening on the news uh, every evening. So that really got me motivated. Um, I, I, it, was it was more material than I could possibly write a book about. So I worked with Tom and I began to talk to family members of some of those folks. And gradually I, I narrowed it down to um, four individuals. I decided to focus on four uh, Nisei men, four young men of draft age. Because it seemed to me that, um, although everybody was obviously challenged by this situation, young men of draft age had a particularly difficult set of questions and issues that they had to confront. So um, I'll just very quickly tick through the characters. Um, one is uh, Katsugo Katz Miho. Katz grew up on Maui, a time when, of course, Maui was basically one big sugarcane plantation. He actually was a student at the University of Hawaii when Pearl Harbor happened. He saw the attack unfold from the roof of his residence hall. He uh, ran across the street and uh, joined what became the ter Hawaii Territorial Guard. But then, of course, all the AJAs in the Territorial Guard were summarily dismissed from it shortly after that. At the same time this was happening, uh, Katz's father was being led away at gunpoint from um, the hotel that his family ran on uh, Maui. And so that gave me an opportunity to talk about the DOJ camps and the incarceration of, of the Issei men in particular. Another character is uh, Rudy Tokiwa. Rudy grew up in Salinas, California um, on a farm. Uh, his family was taken first to the Salinas Rodeo grounds and then to Poston. And Rudy was one of those young men that got in a debate um, uh, with at Poston about whether or, or whether to uh, enlist in the 442nd or not, and what the right thing to do was. And so, of course, he he he's one of those that ultimately decided to enlist, and he went on and fought in the 442nd. Um, Fred Shiyosaki, um, Some of you may know Fred. Uh, Fred just passed away recently, a couple months ago. Um, but uh, I chose Fred for a number of reasons. One is I wanted, Fred grew up in Spokane, so he lived east of the exclusion zones. I did want somebody that lived outside the exclusion uh, zone to show that, uh, that part of the experience. And his parents, uh, his immigrant parents had a, a really interesting story. So that again allowed me to, to go into the uh, experience of the immigrant um, generation. 
And uh, and he also, he went down to enlist right after Pearl Harbor. He was told he was an enemy alien and could not resist, which absolutely stunned him. And of course, a year later, um, when the 442nd was created, Fred enlisted uh, at that time. Um, and then the fourth character, of course, is Gordon Hirabayashi. And um, I wanted, of course, a voice of resistance. And I particularly, because of the way the book is structured, I wanted one that started really right at the beginning of the story. And as I think you probably all know, Gordon was a very early resistor. He defied the curfew in Seattle and then refused to register for incarceration. And he launched into what became this protracted legal battle that worked its way all the way up to the Supreme Court. So we follow him and his family. I should, I should say all four of these, these young men, right? we also follow their families through the course of the, of the war years. So at any rate, that's pretty much the book. Um, I really, um, really, what my mission uh, basically was to try to uh, personalize these stories in a way that would shed some light on this history, particularly for um, non-Japanese American readers to make them acquainted with the story and to really understand it on a deep personal level. So rather than trying to write a comprehensive history, I just really wanted to, um, to unfold these characters in a deeply personal way. So that's that's the book. All right, All right. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. The answer is your All right. All right. Nope. Okay, sorry folks, we're going to um, get this sorted out on our end. For the author, I'm going to type a question in the chat and we'll have- uh, Why don't I, hey, hey, Aaron, I'll ask, yeah. I'll ask a question while you guys mute out. I'll ask one to Frank and Daniel and Bradford. Okay, so, you know, each of you approached the books from a different perspective and experience. And I want to start with Frank. What was really the main inspiration for you to take on this project? And I know that you've been involved in this background and I learned a lot about you and your work when I was writing my book, but I'd, I'd like to talk about inspiration, Frank. Well, uh, I just, as I said, the resistance has always been the missing link for me in terms of the Japanese American response to incarceration. With all due respect to uh, you know Dan and, and the Nisei soldiers, the, the resistance is important to know about now because the resistance addressed the constitutional issues of camp in a way that military service could not. Uh, the idea of spilling one's blood for America was at, at, at heart, it was about appealing to public opinion. Uh, and the resistors fought on their own battlefield, not, as I say, in the court of public opinion, but in, in a court of law. Uh, directly addressing, and, and of course, you know, Daniel, you cover uh, Gordon Hibayashi very well, so you, you know, Gordon gets at that too. And so that, the desire by the resistors for justice, the desire to address the constitutional violations of camp, uh, leads in a straight line from the resistance to the redress campaign 35 years later, which I was also very much involved in. Yeah, I, 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 even with my own book, learning so much about Takashi Hoshizaki and the resistance, I found that I had to really search for information on the resistors and everything was really more or less presented from JCL story standpoint and that whole perspective. But interestingly enough, Heart Mountain has a huge resistor background and it was important for us to bring that story forward. The, or, the only organized resistance to the draft was at Heart Mountain in the Fair Play Committee, yes. Right. Well, thanks, Frank. I'm going to turn to Brad right now. And I, I, I know for you, yours was a journey in a different way than mine. Mine was a family journey. Yours was sort of like a journalist journey when you arrived at Heart Mountain and you were doing some research here for the last couple of years. What was the biggest discovery or revelation or what was it about your book that made you say, wow, 
I really need to take this on. Yeah, I mean, I think so. For me, when I when I first came across the story of the Eagles was I was in Wyoming on a totally different assignment. I was writing an assignment about Yellowstone. So I was in Northwest Wyoming for a week. And one day I just sort of came into the Heart Mountain Museum. Actually, Claudia Wade, uh, the board member, was the one who invited us in. So I come in and I think that I have a, a pretty good understanding of, of Japanese American incarceration and, and what happened. And I left being completely embarrassed and floored by how little I really knew as someone who, you know, studied history in college. And I grew up in Hyde Park, New York, and I mentioned that in the acknowledgments of the book. So I had this sort of understanding of, of Roosevelt and his that era of, of history, I thought pretty well. But for me, the, the biggest thing was when I was at the Heart Mountain, you know, at the museum back all the way back in 2013. And I, I read a little bit about the Eagles, but the thing that stuck with me and the thing that really inspired me was there's another image, and I use it in some of my presentations, of a couple teenagers who weren't football players, who were just a couple kids that had, you know, Levi's sort of peg leg jeans and uh, pompadoured hair. And I just could never get that image out of my head because I see these kids and if you had stuck you know, your thumb over their face, they looked like any American teenager at that time. So for me, it was always looking and thinking about that image. And so it wasn't really, you know, some sort of from a, a journalist standpoint that there was this aha moment. But for me, that moment was the moment where I thought I need to tell, I need to learn more about this first myself, because if I don't know anything about this history from someone who has studied history, then, you know, 99% of people who are like me in America don't. And so I always would think about that image and think about how American of an image it was, despite the fact that they were held behind barbed wire in this camp a thousand miles away from their house. Great. I'm going to turn it over to Ray. And, uh, but the next question we're going to pose is to Dan. Um, so Ray, go ahead and hit it. Okay, um, who is the character that was the biggest discovery or revelation for you as you were working on this project? Probably uh, Gordon Hirabayashi. I mean, although I, I lived in Seattle here for 30 years, so I certainly knew the basic uh, outline of what Gordon had done. But um, as, as you may know, Tom, Tom himself interviewed um, Gordon multiple times. Roger Daniels interviewed uh, Gordon. There's a lot, and Gordon, of course, wrote his own book. Um, there's a lot of material on Gordon. And so I really got to dive deep into his thinking and to the very um, carefully worked out principles on which he was basing his, his resistance. So it was, um, he, he's he's a character that just you know really draws you in partly just because of his personality he's so he's so interesting and and sort of quirky in in some ways but he also um he also just laid the case out so clearly that um it, i i felt as if i learned an enormous amount i thought i knew a lot about that already um but i learned so much just from not only reading Gordon and listening to him, but really thinking about the implications of some of the things that he wrote and said and how, and then how they played out. Great, thanks. Brad, why don't you take that, then we'll go to the same question to Frank and then to Shirley. Um, yeah, I, I mean, so, you know, my characters were, for the most part, all teenagers. And uh, the main characters in my book are, are Babe Namora and George Oshinaga, Kichi Ikeda, and um, my gosh, I'm, I'm forgetting, I'm forgetting one and I, oh, Stanley Gawa. So um, I, you know, each of those characters brought something a little bit different to the book. And um, one character that always stuck in my mind was Stanley Gawa. And that was because Stan, even though he's not as big of a character in the book, what Stan represented to me was, you know, Stan grew up and spent most of um, his early childhood in Hawaii. So if his family had stayed in Hawaii and hadn't moved to California, his entire life would have been different. And while he was at the camp, you know, he was on the Eagles, he was on the football team. And then later in life, he ended up becoming a docent at the Pearl Harbor Memorial. 
So you have this character who had spent his entire life as a Japanese American in camp, but if he hadn't, his family hadn't moved to California from Hawaii, he might not have ever been in camp, and then spent his retirement at the site that led to his incarceration. Um, and he endured a lot of abuse during that time when he was a docent. People would come up to him and say, how dare you? Or what side of the war did you fight on? Because he later on uh, fought after World War II. And you just think, uh, I, I don't know, it, it was just always so interesting to me to have a character like Stan who sort of represented the full scale of the possibilities and indignities that the Japanese American community endured through the 30s, through the, the 2000s, when he was still working at the Pearl Harbor Memorial, so. Wow, Frank, how about you? Two characters, Ray. Um, Mitsuya Endo, of course, uh, is a character that most people know only by name, uh, as a name on a history, in a history book, on, on, a, court, on a court document. Uh, so, um, you know, I knew Jim Akutsu when he was alive, and I knew Hiroshi Kashiwagi. Hiroshi's life is an open book. He's written books. Uh, Jim was the inspiration for John Okada's Nono Boy, the great novel. Uh, and so, uh, but Mitsuya, no one had ever met her. I never met her. And uh, reconstructing her life and her voice, most importantly, getting her character's voice right uh, from the few letters and interviews that she gave. Uh, was the most interesting. I talked to her son, and I had a feeling that Mitsuya, being a Nisei name, they love to get you, give each other nicknames like horse and, you know, um, bacon. <laughs> and so I asked her son, did, did your mother have a nickname? And he said, oh yeah, they called her Mitzi. Mitzi, after Mitzi Gaynor, the act, Hollywood actress, uh, which was my guess. And that, that, just that little clue helped uh, click her into place for me as a, as a Nisei woman. But the, the other discovery, Ray, was, and I didn't describe to you uh, the Tule Lake story that Hiroshi Kashiwagi, uh, through Hiroshi's character, we get into the Tule Lake disturbance, so-called riot, uh, the stockade, martial law, tanks, beatings, uh, and underground movements. And the character of George Kuratomi of Sacramento, Kibe Nisei, uh, who led, who was a spokesman for the people in camp against the authoritarian tactics of Raymond Best, the Tule Lake Segregation Center director, uh, led him to become the head of the negoti negotiating committee translator for Shizu Okai, uh, the leader of the Daiho Shakai. Shakai. Um, he, he was a spokesman for those who were thrown into the infamous Tule Lake stockade, uh, the prison within a prison at Tule Lake. Uh, I won't go into it now, but I mean, just just teasing out his character, whom Barbara Takei of the Two Lake Committee, you know, feels is an underrepresented, unrecognized civil rights hero for Japanese American incarceration. Uh, it was um, a, a wonderful discovery. Got to meet her daughter, his daughter, and um, I hope a real contribution to the um, to the canon. Fascinating. You know, it's interesting. I mean, Tsui Endo's name is on the one successful challenge of the incarceration, yet hardly anybody really knows anything about her. And that's one of the great because things. Because she won. Oh. Yes. Yeah. yeah. She, she won her case. So it wasn't revived in the 80s, along with Hirabayashi Kuramatsu right. Yasui with the Kuram Nobis cases, because she won. Right. And well, that's one of the great things about We Hereby Refuse. People now get to know more about her. Shirley, how about you? Well, that's a really complicated question because I have so many families and, and characters in my book, but I would have to say a couple of characters. One, I think, is the Simpson family. Um, again, what's really bizarre about my experience is I'm working day to day with many of the characters in my book, and I'm living that that experience with them. But the Simpson family have, has a very deep and rich history with Heart Mountain, and I didn't really realize that Pete and Elle's father, Millward Simpson, um, actually went into the camps and, and met with the Japanese American World War I um, um, uh, incarcerees like Clarence Uno. Judge Uno's father was a World War I vet. So there was a lot of collaboration between the Simpson family and, and what was going on in camp. What's really pretty crazy is that Al and uh, Pete, who are with us today and comes to our pilgrimage, Judge Raymond Uno comes to the pilgrimages. So these men are in their uh, 80s, 90s, and they're actually intersecting present day when they have this deep history that occurred back in 1942. Um, I think the other um, 
change for me. And I think for me, I suffered a lot of guilt, I think, writing this book. Originally, I wanted it to be more about the characters talking about themselves instead of me talking about how this impacted me. And just sort of really learning, you know, the secrets of my mother and sort of her background and finding out when I looked at her war relocation file, her name is Setsuko Saito, but in the corner, the camp administrator wrote the name Shirley. And that is what she was named for a period of time. Her name was Shirley Saito. And uh, she pretty much gave up that name and kept her Japanese name later, but then she named me Shirley. And I was like, wow. I mean, what, what does that mean when your mother names you that name? I mean, so I feel like I have a lot of connection to what had happened there. Um, and I, the last one, just to throw in something for Frank is, you know, really what I learned about the resistors more in detail. The fact that Takashi Hosazaki on my board, he did fight in the Korean War after that. It had nothing to do with bravery. It had to do with this intellectual capacity. I will fight if you restore my rights. And I really do think the resistors faced a lot of discrimination, a lot of hatred from their own community because of that decision. Jack, walk the, walk the talk, yeah. Thanks, Shirley. Uh, I'm gonna post one, pose one more question to you guys, and then I'm gonna turn it over to Aaron to take the questions from our audience. I'll go to Brad first. Um, did you discover anything in your research that challenged the assumptions that you had when you started working on it? Oh, yeah, and I sort of mentioned it, it briefly, but you know, I, I grew up in Hyde Park, New York, so I, have sort of spent my entire life sort of ensconced in Roosevelt history. And, and I think the thing that really, you know, I knew going into this book, writing it, that it was going to change my opinion on FDR. And, and it would have been, if I had walked out and had the same glowing opinion of Roosevelt as I had going in, uh, I probably wouldn't be on this panel and I'd be on a very different path. Um, but I think the, the thing in the research that really sort of stopped me in my tracks is when, you know, uh, obviously we all know that there was, there was never a real military necessity for the camps. But once all of Roosevelt's advisors and the War Department and everyone is telling Roosevelt, you know, you, you can close the camps. There's no reason to have the camps open. There's no reason to have the camps open. And he basically says, well, yeah, but I have an election coming up in November. So we have to keep the camps open until November because I can't be seen as the person who's closing the camps before I get reelected. And for me, that sort of sort of savage politic really kind of put me back on my heels where you could, you know, it, it, it just it upset me on, on a pretty personal level to think about how callous and calculating that choice was for Roosevelt. And you think about, you know, the, the original choice is, is, it's callous back in February of 1942, but then to extend that harm and to, and to extend that sort of disregard for his fellow Americans, uh, e even as someone who's, who's not Japanese American, it was really hurtful to, to see that and to see that in, you know, primary source documents and to see it really laid out. Um, I, I know there's probably a lot of things in my book that I should talk more about the football team, but, that is really the moment for me that really, really stunned me. Great. Daniel, how about you? Yeah, I mean, lots of things, actually. Each one of these characters was kind of a revelation to me in, in, in and of himself or herself, um, because each one had unique uh, circumstances. I also, Bradford, had the same, you know, thing going on with me and, and FDR. I grew up in a, in a family that absolutely uh, worshipped uh, Franklin Roosevelt. So I had the same sort of reassessment. I think one of the, uh, as I say, there were many, I think one of the revelations for me was um, doing sort of in-depth dive into um, the um, Hawaiian experience, particularly the experience of the Issei immigrating to Hawaii and the uh, conditions they worked under and lived under in the cane fields. That was, um, you know, I, I've been to Hawaii as a tourist. I see the old remains of the sugar mills. I know there were knew there were plantations, but I spent a lot of time in Hawaii talking to people, and then a lot of time just looking at you know 
oral histories and, and documents, just sort of immersing myself in what that experience was like. So it's, you know, it's just one thread in my book, but it was, um, it was maybe the thread that was most surprising to me and sort of from which a lot of the other threads flow was just that the reality of that uh, immigrant experience, particularly in Hawaii, but also uh, uh, the Issei who came to the, to the mainland. Great. Frank, why don't you take it and then we'll go to Shirley with that. You know, like, like Daniel, I was writing this book during the Trump years administration and uh, it was really disturbing to, to see in the news the things that I was writing about in the script. Uh, uh, the same elements of fear and ignorance of the other uh, that open our book are, you know, are present today. Our book opens with the FBI knocking on the door to arrest our grandparents. Uh, ends with ICE knock, breaking down the door to deport immigrants. Uh, book opens with fear of an attack from the Pacific. Uh, and in just one year ago, we had a president who dog whistled a China virus and Kung flu. Uh, and people now feel free to kick and punch people like who look like me on the street. So uh, takeaway is obviously that some things haven't changed. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, I, I, I can see that in our storytelling, the mechanics, showing the mechanics of how mass exclusion and incarceration was executed and enforced once before, uh, you know, uh, we, we, we kind of worked the script towards the end to show the audience, the readers, you know, how to look, identify the warning signs today uh, of what happened uh, back then and how to contest them. Thank you, Shirley. Um, why don't you jump in here? And I'm going to step aside and uh, let Aaron come in and handle the rest of the questions. Yeah, I think that I mentioned a few of the revelations with Takashi Hoshizaki and the Simpson family, but I think probably the biggest, biggest revelation, the biggest shift that I experienced was I had to talk about myself. I had to talk about issues that were extremely painful, like the death of my brother, where I termed and coined the term the Sansei effect. I mean, the incarceration effect of my parents because they were incarcerated as children, but there was a transgenerational impact I think it had on me and my family. Um, and I think it, 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 it I, the other thing is that I was really pushed by my editor to constantly bring my life story, my experience in it. And it really was, I have to say, I, I think it's akin to being in psychotherapy. It really was a very, it was a very painful experience. Um, but I think it really also was a very healing experience as well. So that was the biggest uh, change and revelation for me. Thank you so much for that, Shirley. And hi, folks. It's nice to see you. Thank you for bearing with us as we've, you know, worked this out. It's great to be together virtually. And um, thanks, everyone, also for joining us on YouTube and in the, you know, conference room down the hall. Please do submit questions um, for one or all of our authors. I'm going to start with a question for you, Frank, from Hanako, who asks, can you tell us about how you found your artists and if you had any public engagement in developing your graphic novel? Hmm. Um, the William Luke Museum of Seattle had a vision of three graphic novels. Got a grant from the National Park Service, and uh, the first was Nisei Soldiers Fighting for America, uh, and the second was Camp Resistance, uh, and the third is going to be allies, the, the white Hakujin allies of the Nisei and Camp. Uh, I think Father Tibisar of Seattle will be the main character of that, uh, written by Ken Mochizuki and, and uh, drawn by Kiko Hughes. So, but they put out a request for proposals, and we all answered the the the, the, the uh, solicitation. So that's how we found Ross and Matt hadn't met before. Uh, so it took you know it took a year or two to, to really understand how to work together, uh, and for us to under, to learn how to write a graphic novel in the first place. Uh, so um, public engagement uh, it was all behind the scenes, I and mean, I, I we, we consulted with a number of scholars, all the scholars in the field, uh, to understand. Uh, to get the story just right, historically correct. Thank you so much. And I know we have some other questions coming in, but I want to ask, sort of dovetailing with that, for each of you, at the core of your books and sort of what contributes a lot to making them so powerful and deeply moving stories are the relationships that you both 
describe and that kind of animate the story, but also that clearly went into the process of writing the book. I'm thinking, Dan, with some of the folks that you interviewed, and Brad, you as well, and Shirley t writing about your family and just encountering all of this history, but in particular, the relationship. So I'm wondering, this long-winded question, sort of what guided your storytelling to honor those relationships, take care of those relationships, and, and sort of what have been some of the most maybe rewarding um, outcomes of, of writing these kinds of stories that are challenging, but so sort of powerful and relationship driven. So maybe Dan, we'll start with you. I'll put you on first and then Brad, Shirley, and Frank. Sure, yeah. I mean, one of the great pleasures of this, um, writing this book for me has been meeting uh, the family members and spending time with them and um, to varying degrees, but by and large, uh, most of the major characters in the book, I've been able to spend time with the family members. So, you know, you find yourself um, in Hawaii um, in somebody's um, mother's house uh, in the back room looking at yearbooks and letters and clippings from 1942 or 1943, and then going out and having lunch and talking about them. And you just form real uh, real bonds. And so that's part of it. It's just enjoyable getting to know people uh, on that basis. But you also do gain a kind of insight into your characters that's very hard to gain just by um, even listening to the oral histories, even though you're looking at them and you're seeing the personality. When you are able to talk to, like Fred Shiyosaki was still alive, so I was actually able to spend quite a bit of time with Fred. So either if the individual is still alive or if you're talking to a son or a daughter or a grandchild, you still, you learn a lot about the personalities and the quirks of your characters that, um, you know, they may, may not be mainstream parts of the story, but they are what uh, make that individual a unique human being and a character and somebody you can actually really get attached to. So spending time with family members is extremely uh, rewarding and also extremely positive for me. Thank you so much. And you can tell, Dan, through your storytelling, how much you care for those characters. And it's it's really beautiful to read. Brad. Um, yeah, you know, to sort of jump off what Dan was saying, as someone who isn't a member of the Japanese American community, when I was coming into this story, I sort of told myself that if I wasn't, if I didn't get the okay from the families that I was working with, I wasn't going to do the project. Because not only did I feel like as a, from a journalist perspective, it wouldn't have been as good, but also from a respect standpoint for someone to sort of say, no, I don't really want to be a part of this. And for me to sort of ignore that um, is sort of part of the same problem that got us to the camps to begin with is, you know, just sort of pushing aside uh, the, 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 the desires and, and wishes of this community. So I was really lucky in that the very first family that I reached out to, which is Babe Namora's family, i talk to his daughter, Janet. And I think she sort of felt me out for a little while. Um, and then, you know, everything just sort of clicked. And we talked on the phone. And then I went out to, to California to meet with her and her family. And, you know, I still we still text probably at least once a week. So for me, it was becoming close to each of these families in different ways, whether that was Babe Namora's family or the Yoshinagas, or actually being able to speak with Kichi Ikeda in person. For me, like Dan said, when you do these interviews with family members, you get such a different perspective as you do from an oral history, because you get a perspective from a spouse or a child, or the some of the interviews that I found most helpful were from siblings in that the relationship between a sibling or that a, a younger sister has the way that she views her older brother is much different than you have of, of your own spouse. They have just a, a totally different perspective that I found really helpful in creating characters that, that were teenagers, especially and sort of understanding. And, you know, even some folks that I spoke to who are teenagers in the camp that don't become characters really helped me animate what teenage life was like. So just figuring out what a high school dance was or, how the football players were viewed um, on uh, in the camp. Um, I don't know if any of the rest of you did this too, but at Heart Mountain especially, there was a high school newspaper that really helped me learn what 
sort of the dialect was and what the lingo was and how the kids talked about and talked to and about each other. And I think even though that wasn't a personal connection in 2020 or 2018 or 2019, for me, it still felt personal in a way that I learned a lot about how these high schoolers were talking to each other in you know these terrible conditions. So that was really helpful as well. Thanks, Brad. I mean, an incredible amount of research that you did to, to oh, tell thanks. this story. Um, and surely, I, I'm, I'm sort of pulling in uh, one of David Fujioka's questions here too, but similar question, but you're writing about your family. So this sort of personal reflection on your mom and you know the legacy she's left behind, what was, what was your relationship to sort of telling this story and, and what have family members' reactions maybe been to, to this book? Well, I think, I, honestly, the section on the multi-generational trauma was pretty significant. And re, me really looking back on the impact that this had on my brother and others. And, and um, it was really getting out in the community and having so many people, other sansei, daughters like me saying, Shirley, you've helped me so much, you know, now I understand why my mother was so controlling, or now I understand why my father worked so much. So my book is so different because I live and breathe like Heart Mountain, like every day, as everybody knows who works with me here. And by and large, all of my characters were living characters. I mean, one of them, we just honored her today, LaDonna Zal, who passed away, but I live and breathe Takashi Hoshizaki to the foundation. I work with Normanette and Al Simpson. I work with the Matsumura family. And, and, and so I'm connected to everybody. So I think most of this has to do with me honoring them in their history and setting the story straight. And as Frank knows, we talked a little bit about things I unearthed and found about the resistors in the archival system at Heart Mountain. I just felt like I needed to tell the truth and I had to tell the truth about what was good, what was bad and how that impacted me. So um, it's really been a journey and a process. And I still think the story is being told even this weekend as we're celebrating at Heart Mountain. Thank you so much, Shirley. And Frank, similar question, but to also bring in a question from someone in our live audience, um, Julia Ishiyama, who asks what the response has been to your portrayal of wartime JCL leaders and their stance on incarceration, thinking about sort of the community relationships that you're really illuminating and animating through your, your storytelling as well. Some of my best friends are in JCL. Um, the JCL today is not the same organization as it was in 1942. So that's a little disclaimer. Uh, and um, the organization's going back to Conscience and Constitution in 20 years ago, I've um, never, never heard a peep officially from JACL, National JACL. Uh, and I hope it's because, you know, I was careful enough to get everything right uh, so that there would be no space for any kind of complaint uh, of inaccuracy. And, and I, I was very nervous about that in two, 20 years ago when you know, Mr. Hosokawa was still alive and others uh, uh, who might have complained. Uh, so uh, there's, I think the response has been from the younger people now, uh, my generation and younger, uh, who uh, ex are, are slowly uh, sent, that you know, we succeeded in centering the discussion of collaboration in the Japanese American community in World War II. Uh, and uh, 20 years ago, this was on the fringes. Uh, now, I, so I feel more um, uh, uh, centered and uh, that we, we've made this part of the discussion. I mean, the, the fact that the Wing Luke, you know, out of three books, they made Camp Resistance one of the subjects I, I, I take as a sign of our achievement of, of bringing this discussion into the mainstream, into polite Japanese American society. Uh, so, uh, and of course the Lim report in 1998 helped a lot as well uh, in documenting all, all of this. So uh, thanks for that question. Thank you so much. So to go to another question from our, our live audience here, um, what has been some of the feedback from some of your readers that has really impacted you or stayed with you? Um, I see all of you are thinking here. So I'll <laughs> list out the order again. We'll start Dan with you and then we'll go mix it up. Shirley, Brad, Frank. Um, well, fortunately, the feedback's been very positive, um, and um, both from general readers. Actually, interestingly, um, you know, I just I'm just talking about Amazon reviews and Goodreads uh, comments and things. Actually, um, it seems to be particularly positive from 
what appear to be Japanese American readers. Um, but the, you know, it, it's been some exceptions, obviously, it's been generally pretty, pretty positive, and that's gratifying. But the is sort of in the vein of what I was talking about before, the feedback that really matters to me is from the families. And um, as Bradford said, it, that's, that's what matters when you do something like this, particularly when you're writing about somebody's loved one who has passed away. You don't do that unless um, the family is on board. And you even in even then you really do feel a heavy burden to get things right. Um, and to portray that father or grandfather or grandmother, not just accurately, but um, compassionately and fully. Um, so, um, as I say, so far I've, I've been getting wonderful feedback from family members, and that's uh, that's really gratifying. Thank you so much, Dan. Um, Shirley. Shirley. Uh, well, I think I talked about the multi generational trauma chapter. I think that the biggest um, uh, positive feeling I really got was from the Sansei community, other daughters and sons like me that thanked me for talking about the things that is very uncomfortable for most Japanese American families to talk about. And, and that was really um, hard for me to do. I talked about my own illness, I've talked about how it affected my family and uh, how ups upsetting it was for me personally. Um, I think the other um, thing that was uh, important is the Japanese in Japan have really loved this book and really want to get it published into Japanese. And uh, as you know, the concluding chapter of my book is when I went to Japan and I had an interpreter and I met my grandmother's cousin who told me more about the emotional impact that it had on my grandmother Higuchi than I heard from any relative in the United States. So the Japanese um, uh, readership seemed to be very, very positive as well. But yeah, I've gotten on really positive reviews as well. That's great. Thank you, Shirley and Brad. Yeah. So like Frank and Dan both touched on, I think I, I, I've been really overwhelmed by the acceptance from the Japanese community while I was working on the book, a Japanese American community while I was working on the book and then their reaction after the book. Uh, has really blown me away. And I think I had a lot of sleepless nights in the last couple of years worrying that I was going to screw something up. Um, you know, not necessarily just from a fact standpoint, but from a tone standpoint or from uh, an emotional standpoint or a translation standpoint or something that I overlooked. So I worked really hard to make sure that I didn't screw things up. And um, so far, I've only had, I only had to make one factual change for the paperback. And that was that I put um, Grand Ra or Cedar Rapids in the wrong state in one. So if, if that's the, uh, the factual error that I can make out of the however many facts are in this book, that is the one thing that um, I'll, I'll be happy about. But again, you know, for me, this was really about the families in the Japanese American community um, liking, liking this book and thinking that it was in addition to uh, the history and, and the discourse here on this topic. And so far that um, embrace has really been overwhelming to the point where I sometimes get pretty emotional thinking about it because you work really hard on something and uh, you hope that people like it. And then when they do, it, it can be a little overwhelming. So thank you all for, uh, especially the folks at Heart Mountain at the various pilgrimages and the broader Japanese American community for, um, accepting this book as it is. So thank you. Thank you so much, Brad. And Frank. Takeaways from audience feedback, I'd, I'd say are two. One is the power of visuals. I mean, people are treating this like, oh, I've learned so much. I never knew about the draft resistance or Mitsu Endo and this and that. And, and uh, these stories and the stockade. I mean, these stories are all out there in the, in the books behind me. I'm, I'm, I, just, I just drew from the books behind me uh, to write the script and, and help develop the story with Tomiko. And uh, but the visuals people respond to. I mean, they like, like movies and graphic novels. I mean, uh, they have a power of their own that I hadn't, I hadn't appreciated before. Uh, the other is that I was, I'm pleased the audience, the book has seemed to seemed to have found its audience. Uh, um, first printing sold out, uh, small printing, uh, and that uh, the response was that it is a page turner, uh, which I, I appreciate. That you know, every every word in the book is 
designed to lead up to the ending, which connects the events of 42 to the events of today. So, I mean, there is that, you know, uh, recognition that we are three different characters who don't know each other, but it feels like they're in conversation with each other because they're all focused on the same thing. And that is the, the U.S. government and its in various injustices through executive orders, congressional legislation, and administrative edicts. Uh, so there's a focus to the book that, that pays off in the end uh, that I'm pleased that readers picked up on. Thank you so much, Frank. Karen, can, I, can I add one last thing? Frank reminded me of something. Um, one other thing that's been really rewarding, and I'm sure all of you have gotten this to, to some degree too, is seeing your book um, taught in, in high schools or middle schools or colleges or added to summer reading lists. And I think that when that happens, at least for me, it helps feel like, okay, maybe there will be fewer kids that have this gap in their knowledge, fewer American kids who will be like me who grew up on the East Coast that you know don't have any Japanese American kids in their classes and like don't learn about this in middle school or high school or even college. So every time I get a Google alert that you know my book is in like another library or it is um, added to some sort of summer high school reading list. That makes me feel good, not just as the author of that book, but as someone who wrote this book partially as a response to not knowing this history. So that's been really rewarding as well. And something I'm reflecting on, on uh, as I'm listening to each of you is you've each mentioned you know wanting to get it right and wanting to tell the story right and the research and the care that went into that. And I also think about all four of your books are so different from each other and they tell different pieces of the story. And to me, it's just a reminder that there is always space for more stories. We always need to hear more of these stories and more perspectives. And I know Shirley, you and I have talked about that, but to folks listening, you know, it's it's a time to ask your family, your ancestors, your communities questions and, and write these stories down and get it right in the way that is right, you know, for you and for your family. Um, there's never never an end. Yes, Shirley. I just want to mention something is, oh, and I listened to Dan and Brad, how they said, oh, we really want to make sure we got it right for the Japanese American community. And, you know, we want to honor the families and the accuracies of the Japanese American community. I got to tell you, the Japanese American community is more critical of a Japanese American then they would ever be critical of either one of you. And I'll tell you, that was my biggest fear because I, being chair of this foundation, you don't know how much criticism I got just from, you know, being chair of our mountain. Can you imagine if I actually wrote some of that stuff down? And, you know, luckily everyone was happy. The fact that Takashi was happy made me happy. He bought 30 copies to share with, you know, so to me, that was my acceptance was when Takashi said, you're doing a good job. You don't know what that meant. You do a good job, surely. And it's the kind of pressure a Japanese American is under to, to, to function properly is huge. And that's why I spent most of my life running away from the Japanese American community. Who wants to be criticized? I'd rather hang around with the, you know, the white community and Cody and have them tell me how great I am. You know? <laughs> but anyways, had to throw that in. That's great. And I think that's an important, you know, piece to throw in, Shirley. It's there's a different weight, definitely, when you're writing about your family and your community too. And, you know, anyways, thank you for sharing that. Um, we have a couple more audience questions. We're gonna wrap up in about seven minutes um, and move on. But I wanted to ask a question also from David Fujioka from earlier that's less about the storytelling and maybe about the experience of being an author and a published author in this moment, which was, you know, what was the experience of releasing a book that each of you worked for years on in the midst of a pandemic? Maybe there were some silver linings to that. I'm thinking this is a little bit of a silver lining, <laughs> uh, but some of the struggles and, and maybe hopes or things that you're looking forward to for your book in the months to come as, as things start to hopefully open up a little bit more. Um, Frank, just to mix it up, let's start with you and then we'll go from there. Well, I'll speak for everyone and say we, we miss live book events, we, we miss live readings, we miss signings, uh, and, and you're getting that direct feedback from readers. I know, I know we'll all, we'll all, we all feel that. Uh, personally, um, it meant that we couldn't meet with the artists face to face to work out some visual problems, had to do it all by memo and emails, very frustrating. Um, on the other hand, I got a lot of work done in the pandemic. I, I got two books done uh, because all we have to do is sit at, sit at home in Seattle and keep your butt in the chair and uh, and write. So you know, it had it had its um, ups and downs. 
maybe I'll just open it up to the rest of the three of you if there's anything you want to add to that or just sort of retweet. Uh, yeah, I would just say basically the same thing, which is that for me at least, it, the timing of the pandemic actually worked out pretty well. I mean, considering what a hideous thing it was. Um, I had, the, the important thing was I had just finished the bulk of the research, you know, which involved a lot of traveling and going into archives and being out in the world and getting on planes. I had basically wrapped that up just before the pandemic hit. So I was able to spend that year finishing the manuscript, going back and forth with my editor, which is, you know, a year long process basically and getting the thing ready to go out into the world. So there was a little bit of a silver lining for me too. Yeah, as as someone with a three-year-old and a one-year-old, my uh, <laughs> the past 18 months um, have been a little harried, but I'll also say that I got most of my edits, I got my first draft into my editor in December of 2019. And then I got my first wave of edits in like right before everything shut down. Um, I will say that the first night, my my book came out on uh, January 5th and my first book event was while people were still literally in the Capitol building the next night. Um, so that was, it was a little hard to be like on Twitter and say, hey, like if anyone's interested in checking out a book event right now, yeah. come on over. I'm talking with the Wall Street Journal. Um, so that was, you know, it, it was it was tough. I, I mean, I don't think any of us would say that this was a, an, an ideal situation for us as authors. But, you know, I got to speak with lots of different events and, you know, doing events in Cape Cod or Phoenix or Sacramento or Denver or lots of lots of different places that I might not have they might not have said, oh, I can fly you out here. And the kind of people that I was able to do book events with. Like I did a book event in San Francisco with Patrick Radden Keefe and they wouldn't have flown me and Patrick Radden Keefe out to San Francisco to do this event together. So, you know, all of us have been looking for silver linings in the past year. And, and I think that there certainly, there certainly are some, I just will say that my book coming out right before the insurrection on the Capitol, the next week was articles of impeachment. The next week was, the impeachment vote. So it felt like every week where I'd have like a, oh, my week, my book has been out for two weeks. What uh, American calamity is about to happen? So, uh, but again, we get to do cool events like this too, so. I think for me, uh, I would just say in some ways it really sucked um, because part of what my problem was, was that uh, my book was actually supposed to come out earlier. So I would have missed the pandemic. But um, when I had got my advanced copy, I was reading one of the most uh, emotionally charged sections. I think it was when my mother was dying and my father didn't want my mom to leave. So I had to convince him it was okay that she died. Um, they actually went from page 260 to 262 and they flipped the page. They had to reproduce the whole first printing which delayed the book right into the pandemic. And I'm pretty much of a social animal. If I could get people in the room, I could sell anything. And I think I would have sold a lot of books if I had my in-person events. So I hope it isn't uh, inappropriate to have book events, you know, a year after your book was released, because I'll probably have a couple of parties in DC to make up for uh, for the big loss. Yeah. So that's great. I, th I think all of us get a do-over. Yeah. Okay, good, good. <laughs> you heard it here. That's great. Yeah, well, surely we'll we'll look forward to those parties. Um, and Brad, I actually tuned into that event with Patrick Brad and Keith, and it was great. Oh, so thank you. It's yeah. been, you know, really, really great events. Um, okay, so I think for for this last question, I'm going to combine an audience question with one of my own. Um, so there's a question from the live audience here saying, "You all spoke so eloquently about the past, both today and in your books." What propels you now in this particular moment of maybe we should say ongoing social reckoning? Um, and then what maybe piece of advice, we'll, we'll limit it to one, would you have for folks who are thinking about doing this kind of writing or storytelling um, in this particular moment that we will be in? You know, um, what, what really sort of propelled you forward and, and can you offer to, to those of us thinking about it ourselves? So we'll start, we'll do the same order, Dan, Shirley, Brad, Frank. Sure. Um, you know, I think in terms of advice, if I were, you know, advising somebody on what to write or how to write in this moment, 
absolutely be aware of the moment we're in in history. I think we are at the, in the most perilous time in our history in my almost 70 years on this planet. I really believe that. I think democracy itself is threatened. So that's a big thing to address uh, in writing, of course. My advice would be to make it personal. Find personal stories that stories that people can really connect to on a deeply personal level, rather than um, trying to sketch out a piece of history and tell all the things that are right or wrong about that pe period of history. Just bring it home. You know, bring it home to the heart. Talk to the heart, and um, and you will have an impact on on the way we move forward. I think. I think we writers have a um, unique opportunity here going forward to make sure that history is told honestly, even if sometimes brutally, that we use honest language, that we tell the stories that um, haven't been told. So we have a lot of opportunities and um, I think it's actually a great time to be writing. Thanks so much, Dan. Shirley. Um, I think pretty much the same about, write about what makes you cry, you know, write about what you're afraid to talk about, write about things that you know that other people have problems talking about too. I think the reason why Dan and Brad, you know, as non-Japanese Americans, why you were so well received is because you're a voice. You're like our LaDonna's All, where we give a Compassionate Witness Award to somebody who hasn't been in that victimized role, but has the ability to research and tell it. Mm -hmm. So uh, my advice is write about what hurts. Yeah, I, I'd say my advice right now is if you're thinking about writing a book, actually do it. Yeah. Like it's, it's, it's a very hard thing sometimes to, to take that step. And I think that if the past 18 months have taught us anything is that our lives are very fleeting. And I think that there's times where we say, we'll do something tomorrow, we'll do something next week when, when things settle down or when things are a little bit easier. And things might not get easier for you, for your community, for your family, for your country. And the people that you want to talk to for this might pass away or might become reluctant. And I think that there's no reason you can't or shouldn't do something right now. And I think that was the thing when I wrote this book was that I'd been kind of working around the edges of it. And my wife said, you're never going to do this unless you take the time after your day job to go somewhere, work on your book proposal, get this done. And I think that that was the kick that I really needed. And I think that it's good advice for anything in life, but especially when it comes to writing. And for folks that aren't or don't consider themselves right now professional writers, it's even harder to feel a sense that uh, you can't do this when we all have the skills to do this, no matter how we tell a story, whether it's uh, in a graphic novel or a memoir or a narrative nonfiction, we all have the skills within us to tell the story of our family or, or a totally different story. Uh, you just have to figure out the way to do it. Um, and for me, answering the first part of your question, what this book and working on this book for the last three or four years has really sort of realigned my thinking and the how I want to not only live the rest of my life, but the, how I want to live the rest of my life professionally and the kinds of stories that I want to tell and the kinds of stories that I think people need to know about. And there's been times in the past where I've sort of said like, oh, okay, I'll work on that story for a while, but I don't feel that sort of emotional or moral connection to it, where this story I really did. And going forward, whether it's magazine stories or other books or whatever I want to work on, that is now sort of my driving impulse is, is to look at things that way, so. Look, I, everyone said the right thing. I would just add that if you wanna write something, uh, get, a, get a notebook or a computer software like a Scrivener, I use Scrivener, and just write down a thought, your thoughts every day to, about what you want to have this be about. Uh, and then give yourself a year, look, back, look at it after a year and see what you have and then shape it. And just know that only you could have written those words. No one else could have, obviously. So only you could have done that. So that's yours and uh, work with it.
thank you so much, each of you, for, for sharing your time, for sharing your work, um, and for answering these questions. Frank, I'd love to hear some Scrivener tips from you at some point. We'll be back. Um, <laughs> I need help. Aaron. It's, 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 it's a big learning curve on Scrivener. Very yeah, stupid. Okay. I, haven't, I haven't done it yet. Yeah. We'll figure I, it out together. I jumped in, and I was like, I'm just going to do this in Google Docs. I, I can't do this. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm with you. Yeah, yeah. Well, that aside, um, thank you so much. Before, um, I'm so sorry, folks in the audience, I know there are questions we didn't get to. So Frank, Shirley, Dan, and um, Brad, if you have a moment before you log off, if you want to type a few responses, Brad, I know there's a question for you from Pete Simpson about the opponents of the Eagles. Um, thank you so much, folks at home and here in Cody for joining with us. Um, I'm going to pass it off now to Denny and Sam to give us an update on fundraising for the Manetta Simpson Institute. Thank you so much, folks. Thank you all. Thanks, Aaron. Bye, Hi, everyone. I'm Denny Hirsch again, and I'm back this time with Sam Mehara, one of our board members, um, and who you heard about earlier and heard from when we dedicated uh, the Sam Mehara Theater to him. Um, and one of the reasons we did that was because he's such a generous donor, and he's with me here today to talk about why he give so much from his heart to Heart Mountain uh, and why he wants you, he has a special match gift um, that he wants you to help match. So I'm gonna pass it over to Sam to talk about why he gives and why he thinks it's important for you to give. Well, thank you, Denny. Um, I, I appreciate the opportunity to talk about, uh, about donating. Let me quickly go back and, and get some facts straight. Uh, I am not a philanthropist. I don't have you know oodles of money pouring out of, uh, of my resources in order to uh, put in. What's happened is um, I've learned there's a great satisfaction, a, a real sense of of happiness, of, of being able to do something that's useful. Uh, because uh, I've been able to find a way to get income, which I, I don't I don't need it. You know, I, if I if I got another dollar, I it's not going to make a difference in my life. Um, I've taken care of the family. You know, taking care of my needs, uh, and uh, and it turns out that uh, what's what's most meaningful in life is to uh, satisfy uh, others once you've taken care of your yourself. Uh, and and there's a need uh, for an organization like the Heart Mountain Wyoming Foundation to uh, to get. Uh, the the talents and the resources and and specifically the money uh, to achieve their their goals and the Minetta, Minetta Simpson Institute is, a, is certainly in that category. So when I started talking, um, I found out that uh, there's a there's a market for people to hear. Uh, quality stories on what happened and why it happened and the lessons learned. And so uh, I found out that uh, there are a lot of people willing to pay uh, quite, a bit of, quite a bit of money. Uh, some people don't have a large budget to, to pay for speakers. Um, typically, uh, inner, inner core city uh, schools have very, very limited budgets. Uh, but other organizations are are more generous. I, I I've given uh, speeches at at uh, some conferences and, and some large uh, organizations like uh, uh, Wall Street law firms, uh, where I would you know they would ask me you know what, what do you charge and and I said well I hesitantly talk about uh, you know the kind of money that. I think it would be reasonable, you know, sometimes uh, three, four, five thousand dollars per per speech. Uh, and some of them says, uh, "Sam, you're cheap." So, so that tells me that um, if there's a need, there's a way to to satisfy it in a way. 
that it, it gives me great pleasure to to teach people. Like like I mentioned earlier today, you know, I find across the country ninety percent or more of the of the people never heard about what happened. This this mass injustice in this country. So in one hour, I was able to I am able to convince them because of my background as to what happened and and tell them about my experience and that it, it should never happen again to anyone else. And then I would talk about, in some cases, I talk about uh, uh, how it might happen to uh, other people today. Uh, and and so that that's something that's useful for, for many people and they're willing to, to uh, provide funds. And uh, it, it really is helpful to uh, let my sponsors know that I'm, I'm giving every nickel that I obtain uh, to the foundation and toward this project. And uh, it's been growing every year. Fortunately, this year, um, I've been able to put in a large percentage of some $60,000 that I've collected. And uh, I hope to have more uh, in the future. So, so thank you for your attention. And um, and the answer to the question is, uh, I'm doing it because I'm satisfied by uh, educating people, and it's the source of funding that uh, I provide to the foundation. So thank you, Denny. Thanks, Sam. And I just want to add that, um, so Sam made a $20,000 pledge per year for three years, and then he added $40,000 this year alone. So we want to, uh, as, a, as a match, ask our viewers and those here in Cody with us today to help us reach that match, help us reach 40 more thousand dollars this weekend by donating. And as Sam said, you don't have to be a philanthropist. You don't have to be rich. Give from your heart, give to help educate others about what's happened, what has happened in the past so that it does not happen again. And whether you give $5 or fifty thousand um, dollars, or five hundred thousand dollars, we'll take it all um, gladly and with gratitude for um, even one dollar, because every dollar, every nickel, like Sam said, counts, and it helps us reach our goals. So we are well on our way to two million dollars, and our goal is to get to five million dollars by the end of next. Well, by but this time next year, so that we can break ground on the Mineta Simpson Institute at Heart Mountain. So help us reach our goals and help us educate the world about the incarceration that happened in during World War II so that it does not happen to anyone in any future generation. Thank you. Thank you.